This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkungu Pride is such a firm favorite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. The Evoker boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 28th episode of Safari Lives, the weekly character update here from the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park in South Africa and, of course, the Masi Mara, as David Gathamba Githu says, in Kenya. Today we have a world premiere on camera. In the tent today we have got Conrad's little brother, Marcel. You may show us your thumb. You see? Beefy thumb, that is. Good. We are going to be focusing on various things today, or the characters that we saw during the week. These include the Inkuhuma Pride and their tactics. And that's going to be the focus of the tent. In the meantime, let's have a look at where our characters were. It's been a varied week of interest, romance, and volcanic heat in the Western Kruger. Tingana continued his remarkable territorial expansion, pushing far south into Chitwa before finishing off way in the north. He and Hosanna met in the middle of Juma briefly, father showing no signs of losing patience with his son. The young Talamati male continued his lonesome adventures. He has so much to learn. Meanwhile, love filled the cloying air with two mating pairs of lions. The evokers are ensuring a genetic legacy. But for those lionesses looking for love, the Inkahumas have reunited. Up in the Mara, there was great excitement with the return of Kakenya. The hyena action came from the Happy Zebra Clan. On the lion front, the Magoro Pride received a visit from a sausage tree male while the Olololos fed like it was holiday season. So quite a lot of action to look forward to during the course of the next two hours or so. Like I say, I will be looking at the Nkuhumas and their hunting tactics largely. Uh, we've got Crawley out, we've got Sydney out, we've got David and the Mara and Tristan, and they too will be looking for and talking about our very favourite characters. Please talk to us using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and the YouTube chat stream. You, of course, know how to do that, most of you. And if you don't, well, please start talking to us as soon as you can. Something is singing to me just to the right here. I'm going to throw it away immediately. While I do that, let us go across to Sydney, who is, uh, well, looking about in the heat, 36 degrees. Uh, these days is becoming very much interesting just looking at these green bushes and all the trees starting to gain a lot of leaves where these leopards can easily hide. A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the Afternoon Safari Lives. I am Sydney Fumurani Mikosi and I'm traveling with Dave, who is my camera operator. We will try by all means and get to see something interesting this afternoon. But please don't forget that this is an interactive live safari. You can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Lives. So I am looking for Hosanna this afternoon. And maybe we're going to be lucky as he, he got disappeared with me uh, two days ago. But while I'm looking for Hosanna, I want to show you something very, very interesting he has been doing uh, during the course of the week. The little chief had a belly to fill this week. He spotted a steenbuck and his dinner plans were set. Placing one careful paw at a time, Hosanna geared into a stealth mode. Moving over his first obstacle, Hosanna managed to keep the silent hunt going. As Hosanna crept a little closer, we held our breath a little longer. 
the Steenbok continued to feed, drifting towards the waiting leopard. The Steenbok seemed to glance in Hosanna's direction, missing the spots in the grass. Perhaps it was a leopard scent on the breeze, or maybe the antelope eventually saw the danger. Hosanna was forced to try again. The little antelope, the Steenbach, has just proven to us that these predators, they rely on their spots, but this spot pattern only work the most when they are stationary. Once they move, the prey animal is going to detect them. So these animals, they do rely on this conceal concealment when they are very static. Any little bit of a movement, the prey is going to discover it and run away. And that is what we saw. Unfortunately, Osana did not win the battle. So let's hope to see him this afternoon. Maybe he's going to do some hunting or we might find that his stomach is full already. So now uh, let's cross over to Koli, who is also out on a game drive at the moment. Good afternoon and welcome to Safari Lives. My name is Koli, my name is Klo. Joining me behind the camera is uh, Craig. Here we have uh, some interesting animal to show you. And we are coming to you live from Kruger National Park in South Africa. It's my first time in this episode of Safari Lives. So I'm so lucky to take part of in this episode. It's so hot today. It's about uh, 37 degrees Celsius in South Africa. That's approximately 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So I will try to move slightly back and see whether I will get a Great shot from for, 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 for Craig. So he will be able to show you guys some beautiful giraffes over here. There are two. Craig, is it fine? Slightly forward. Should be fine. Thank you. Here we have two giraffes. And this loop. This is a male giraffe because I can see on top of the ossicons there, there's hair around the ossicons, at the tip of the ossicons. So that what the females lack. And you can see there's patches there due to fighting for territorial reasons to other rival males during mating season. They're foraging around here on the heat of the day. He's looking at the, at, at the other giraffes. So while I'm waiting here to see what will happen to these two giraffes, let us go up to the Mara with David and see what he has for us. Hello and a very good afternoon everyone and very well done Oli for seeing a giraffe. I remember my days when I see giraffe in South Africa, I would get very excited because we see more giraffes in the Mara Triangle than I would see down there. My name is David and I'm coming today is Achi. Hello everybody and it's such an exciting day to have all of you on board. Remember our Safari Zulu is very interactive. Should you have any questions or any comments, please send them through. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can keep following us on the YouTube chat stream. You may ask us why does that buffalo have some birds on top of his back? That's a very good question to ask. And yesterday I made such a big mistake or rather I did a very wrong prediction of the weather and I said it's not going to rain but it rained very heavily. What am I saying? I'm saying the temperatures now look perfectly okay for me. 
25 degrees Celsius and 77 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not going to commit myself today about the weather. I'll just keep quiet and watch how the day will go. Well, any time we see buffaloes like this, sometimes you'll always see lions come in to sneak on them. And the birds I was talking about there is because that's an ox baker that will be trying to get some, you know, some bugs out of it. I'm talking about ticks or mites. And because the migration is gone at the moment, we are having now lions having to deal with animals like buffaloes to feed on. Well, they have been having a bumper harvest. I'm talking about the lions with all the migration going on and they've been eating a lot. And what happens? Once the migration is gone, they are all full. Chances are we'll always see them trying to mate to continue their progeny of the lions in the Mara Triangle. Male lions must leave their pride at about the age of two and a half years to establish their own territories or join other male coalitions. More so territories with lionesses to mate with. This young sausage male found himself two lionesses of the Mogoro pride. Apparently, both of them interested in him. Sometimes male lions do copulate with two females at the same time. It seemed one of them was in estrus and ready to start a new generation. But clearly there was a case of jealousy between these two females. He waited patiently and finally the other lioness was okay to let the lovebirds have some fun. Live. And the lesson here we need to take home is of all the cats I know in Africa, lions have been known to have very synchronized kind of living. They sometimes have synchronized nursing when you get two females nursing at the same time. But also once in a while we've seen two lionesses going through estrus at the same time. And when you get males that are pretty young and very strong, they will mate with both of them at the same time. And that's what we saw in that young sausage male with those two females that belong to the Mogoro pride. Well, it's time to move on. And my plans today is to look for a rhino. Yesterday, when it was raining, I saw a rhino from a distance and I lost this because the rains were very, very heavy. And now I'm sure talking about lions mating. James Henry is an expert of the same subject. I uh, expert on the subject of lions mating, I'm presuming is, he, is what he means. Uh, well, I don't know if I'm an expert on it, but certainly as I sit here with my friends, the stingless bees, can you see them all over here? I think it's quite fun. They're all back in the giraffe skull. And we've just been having a little chat, a bit of a catch-up. Of course, they're very happy for me that I'm going on leave tomorrow. Uh, but I've also been telling them, of course, about the interesting interactions between the Evoca males and the Inkohumas. And, well, summer of... The hot summer air remains charged with the romance of an Evoca male and the ridge-nosed Inkohuma lioness. Last week, the male was disinterested. This week, however, he was in the mood. The lioness saw fit to play a little hard to get. A paw to the face is hardly encouragement. In his shame, the male nearly dropped off again. But then, as the setting sun provided some soft mood lighting, she acquiesced. Please avert your eyes briefly. Soon, with any luck, new cubs for the Unkahumas.
So that's very exciting indeed. Now also we had the youngest Inkahuma lioness mating with another Avoca male. So with any luck, like I say, lots of new Inkahuma cubs on the way. Remember that this has not been the first time that the Inkahumas have mated with the Avocas. Amber Eyes has mated with them. I think the youngest lioness has mated with them before as well. And that would generally mean that she's probably wa or she was probably in an anestrus, which is a false estrus that kind of solidifies identifies a bond between new males and the lionesses, but she doesn't fall pregnant, and the reason for that is that should these new males not survive in the area for long, she doesn't go through the effort of producing youngsters only to have them killed by yet another coalition of males coming in. So I suspect that's what happened with the youngest lioness, and now she's mating again. Interestingly, we didn't show you there because we didn't actually get it nicely on camera, but the male that the youngest lioness was mating with were, is not relaxed like that blonde male there. He's got a darker mane. He's definitely much less comfortable around vehicles. He was snarling at us. Well, I mean, I don't really blame him for that. You know, he was trying to have a bit of private time, and all we were doing was following him while he was trying to have that private time. But he does have a very different character from the other two evokers. Now I am going to show you a little bit more about these bees at some stage. We'll just try and set something up a little bit later. And while we set that up, let's go across to Tristain, who is going to tell you more about the Masimara and the fascinating things going on there. Well, yes, indeed you are across to us on a very beautiful afternoon. Once again, the big storm clouds that roll in to the Mara are starting to come through this time of the day. Not quite as dramatic as yesterday's storm that we had in a similar area, but still very, very pleasant. And as you can see, we've got a bull Ellie that's just kind of moving around as well and, and having a bit of a feed. Now, these guys, what you'll find is that they'll be feeding down on this grassy area now, and soon they're going to be moving up towards the escarpment as soon as that kind of storm has broken. But as James mentioned, my name is Tristan on camera. I've got a Manu this afternoon, and it is very, very, very nice to be on another episode of Safari Lives where we're going to try and delve into all of the characters and see what we can find. Hopefully we'll be able to find some of the characters that we have seen during the course of the week. We're heading down to an area where um, the happy zebras were um, with their little ones, so towards that den, the happy zebra clan of hyenas and also where Kakenia has been hanging around. So that's hopefully what's going to kind of happen for us. Maybe we'll get lucky with one or the other. Um, but in the meantime, we kind of got waylaid with a few Ellie's. It's always so nice just to stop and appreciate Ellie's. They are an amazing creature. And, and here in the Mara, the views that you often get with Ellie's and the kind of backgrounds and the storms and, and just the sort of light and everything else is absolutely wonderful. He's also, of course, being... A typical boy which is showing off exactly how much of a boy he really is and has been flaunting it the entire time we've been talking which I've tried to ignore but it's impossible as he's kind of been moving it around all over the place but for those of you that are not sure what I'm talking about uh, it's a fairly obvious that his manhood is dangling quite manfully I would imagine is a good word for it between his back legs and so if you see that it is not a, a figment of your imagination yes that is his um, reproductive organ that is out. Male elephants often do do this, particularly if maybe a, a herd has passed and, and he's picking up a scent of a female that could be an estrus, could also just be a display to us to say, you know, I'm the big boss around here. They often do do that. And, and it's amazing actually how they kind of walk around with it out and just don't care. They are quite happy to show everybody kind of what's going on. But it's always a bit of a laugh when it does happen. But this bull is not a hugely old bull. He's definitely not the biggest that we see out here is a fairly young um, individual uh, in comparison to some of the other guys but would be mature enough to be able to mate and so while all of you are giggling and laughing I suppose it is now he's covering it up you see he's, you've embarrassed him you all started laughing at him and so he's covered it up to say you can't see it anymore now stop laughing at me and uh, <laughs> of course that's ridiculous he's not doing that at all he's just moved his foot forward but um you know, he will be able to reproduce at this age. If he was lucky enough to come across a female in estrus before a bigger male, he might then get lucky enough to actually kind of be able to re uh, reproduce and to, to maybe have a mate, which would be lucky for him, given his age. 
Very, very nice though. It's always so peaceful watching these guys at this time. And you know what I like about this time of the day generally is that it's at the time of the day where most of the vehicles, uh, they on and off in drive, but they see the storm coming and they start actually heading back to the camps. And so the park typically is quite quiet. Good. So we're going to head off down to the burn section, see if we can find Kikenia or Happy Zebras. While we do that, let's send you back across to Sydney, who's still on the lookout for the little chief. I am right looking uh, for the uh, little chief, Osana. I'm checking the Chitakat line, which is the border between Juma as well as the uh, Torchwood. So just to see if his tracks are not coming out from Torchwood to Juma side. So the last time I saw Hosanna here, he was trying his luck on some of the animals. He was chasing, in fact, a, a, a steen buck. But apart from that steen buck he tried, I want to show you something very small Hosanna has been trying to get hold of earlier this year. After a failed steen buck attempt, hungry Hosanna was still looking for a meal. After some late afternoon refreshment in the mighty heat, he sought a light snack. At this time, a scrub hare was a target. The prey blissfully unaware of the lurking cat. Hosanna showed great patience moving to within just a few meters. For some reason, he chose not to strike. Perhaps he wasn't so hungry after all. So I cannot find the tracks of Osana. Maybe he jumped from this uh, torch wood to Juma side. The road is too narrow. <laughs> I'm sure he can make it to jump from this side to the other side. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> so we have just seen that uh, these kind of big cats, sometimes when they're too hungry, when they're not winning, when it comes to hunting, they can also take these uh, diminutive sized animals, such as the uh, scrub hare. Scrub hare is enough it's, a, it's enough for them to have a snack <laughs> and carry on hunting whenever it's possible. <laughs> uh, Jackie, uh, Hosanna has no luck with scrub hair. That is true. A scrub hair is quite a very difficult target because it doesn't go straight. The scrub hair, they use old strategy of going zigzag. <laughs> and zigzag is always a challenge. I saw the other day the scrub hair is also a struggling tandy. She tried some other scrub hair twice in front of me and she couldn't win. It's a very small animal, but can be fast. But sometimes Tandy does win when it comes to the scrub hare. So it means Hosanna still has got a long way to go in order to catch the scrub hare. He was supposed to, in fact, start by learning how to catch the scrub hare before targeting the easy impalas. <laughs> But there's been quite a lot of... Uh, there's still quite a lot of tracks of other animals here, so I'm still going to carry on checking. Now, let's cross over to James, who's got something to share with you. So it really is quite interesting that Horsana uh, seems to fail as often as he does. And in fact, during that Stienbock hunt, I was asked, is he a successful hunter? Obviously, a viewer quite suspicious that perhaps he isn't very good. I think he is very good, and I think that these lions and leopards just have a very tough time actually catching things, especially in the middle of the day. They are crepuscularly designed, if you like, to hunt during the crepuscular hours or nighttime hours, 
And so I think there's a lot of luck required for them to catch during the day. The cover has to be just right, the wind has to be blowing just right, they have to hope that the animal has its back turned to them, was occupied with something else like fighting off other males from its females, that sort of thing. Otherwise it really is very difficult for them to catch during the day. Now I just wanted to quickly, before we move on to our next character, because these stingless bees have been a character at Safari Live for some time. In fact, for many years they have held and kept a hive inside this giraffe skull. The giraffe skull has been dropped, moved, thrown around, it's had Brent Leo Smith leaning on this entrance tunnel once or twice by mistake and so, well, they've done very well to survive and you can see that it's now a new clear tunnel. They've had some interior decorators and exterior architects in to help them design a newly, uh, well, I'm going to say, really quite modern and, and clear entrance tunnel to their nest. And for many segments, I suppose, we only saw one or two in there. But if you look around me, I mean, there are hundreds of the things, hundreds of little, little stingless bees. And it really is wonderful to see them back in our giraffe skull. So they are an important character here at Safari Live. The only thing is that we're not really able to get into the nest to have a look at the honey that they're making because, well, they've picked a very secure location, haven't they? Now another character who has unfortunately recently departed, I don't mean this mortal coil, I do mean of course just Safari Live, is Brent Leo Smith and he, the other day in his sort of finale, managed to find most of the Uncle pride all united. With the exception of the mating lioness, the Inkahumas seem to have reunited, possibly because relations have been solidified between the Pride and the Evokers. Old Purple Eye led them, with Amber Eyes bringing up the rear, her bloodied paws indicating a recent meal, most likely not shared with the rest. There was no resentment, however, and the bonds with our favourite lions remain strong. So I think that the... Uh, <laughs> I was saying I don't think there's any resentment with the rest of the pride that uh, Amber Eyes had herself some blood on her feet, and we were just sort of... Um, thinking about the situation in the final control before we started this show and Amber Eyes wandering up to the rest of the Pride and them going, what's, what's on your hands there? I mean, have, have you just had something to eat? And then sort of sulking away from her because she'd clearly kept her takeaway to herself. It obviously didn't happen like that because the Pride looked very happy with each other as they tend to do. Now, Lauren, you have a question about whether or when the sub-adult Nguhumas are going to mate. Well, in theory, they are sexually mature at about two and a half years, males and females. Well, males probably a little bit later. And in theory, the males could, or the females could bear young round about now-ish, I suppose. Yes, some of them are two and a half years old. Interestingly, in the Kruger... Records show that between 36 and 48 months actually is round about the time when they normally have their first litters. So although they are capable now of falling pregnant, some of those young lionesses, it's unlikely that they will until they're 36 to 48 months old. That's, of course, three years to four years. I'm not sure why the book that I read didn't say three or four years. It's much easier than working out, or working it out from the months. So that's probably when it'll happen. Let us go back to David Gathambagithu, who is up in the Masamara, and he has got the, well, I suppose, wetland equivalent of a meerkat. Well, I got some very special carnivores at the moment. What happened there? They must have been spooked by something. I don't know what it was. They got immediately some call, everybody back, take cover, go for safety, and they all ran inside, apart from that one particular thing up there. And these are the banded mungus, or was it a false alarm? And if it was, they'll all be coming out. You can see three are outside there and one's trying to pop the head out of that tumbling mound. 
This ones here, as I said, are called the banded mungus, and we've got all types of munguses in Africa. In general, munguses are very solitary, but this ones and another species that is called the dwarf mungus will always go in big colonies. Anything 2 to 70, 20 to 70 rather, but an average of about 40 in every colony of what sometimes we say a business of mungus. Oh yeah, I see what's spooking them there, and that's hamacop. So I think below that Taman Mount, there's an area that has the green, the green grass there. That area is all wet, there's like a wet pan there, and I think that hamacop was fishing there, and either as maybe she was diving or trying to catch some frog or something in the water, the mungus did not understand that and they got really scared and they all ran and pew 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 back inside the mound. Normally the munguses will always patronize abandoned you know tamed mounds and this particular species every few days they will change their homes and go to another mound. Well are going to be leaving these munguses there because they're enjoying the beautiful temperatures that we got in the Mara now. But I'm sure Tristan loves talking about lions. Well, I'm sure they're enjoying these temperatures. It's a beautiful day um, in certain sections. Other sections are getting a lot of rain. You can see this buffalo is quite happy, though. It's sitting very comfortably, having a good chomp on some rumen that it's regurgitated. It's probably thoroughly enjoying a bit of sunshine and will also enjoy when the rain falls because that will provide more mud for it to be able to roll around in. You can see it's had a good mud bath at some point during the course of the day. Now, these guys have lived the charmed life over the course of the last sort of seven months. With the wildebeest and zebra being in town, it means most of the, the lions have been going after those. But the migration has left, and that means that they are now target number one, particularly for the Olololo pride. The migration has finally moved on. The 16 strong Olololo pride, who have many hungry mouths to feed, have now turned their attention to the buffalo that remain. During a stormy night, the lions used the weather to their advantage and brought down not one, but two. Considering there are only four adult females, this was an incredible feat. Unfortunately for the females, their work was not done. As is generally the case in the Mara, the ever-present scavengers were on the scene. The lions had a trump card though, as Blondie, a large male from the Kichwa coalition, strode onto the scene. While the Mara scavengers feared Blondie, the same cannot be said for the cubs of the pride. The sight of dad brought about absolute joy as they bounded to greet and bond with their father. Well, isn't that absolutely amazing that the Olololos have been able to bring down not one but two and it's the, something that they're going to have to keep doing given the numbers that are in that pride at the moment, you know, 16 strong plus the two Kichwa males means that 18 lions that are all fairly large these days are eating a lot of food and so even one buffalo is only going to go so far so they're going to have to repetitively kill quite large amounts of food and, and targeting buffalo herds is going to become a, somewhat of a speciality I would imagine for those guys the good thing is is that they do have at least seven males so i counted seven the other day i'm told that there might even be as many as nine um but seven of those males who are starting to develop now and starting to get bigger and they will be vitally important if they are to hunt buffalo like this most of the buffalo that they will be going after at the moment with just the four adult females and and potentially if the kitchen boys are there would be females and calves um, within a herd system but if they're going to graduate and start targeting lone bulls like this then it's going to be very useful to have those younger males starting to join in in the hunts and, and be able to provide that power to bring down these really heavy set massive males bull buffalo are incredibly powerful and and have a temper to match and it's not an easy target at all for lions and and what we see here in the mara is that very seldom do the lions really target these big bull buffalo if they can help it um, we see the sausage tree pride every now and then going after them but they mostly will try and target females calves um, injured or sick animals on the fringes of herds not so much will they go for kind of lone bulls or bull groups like what we see here so 
It's going to be interesting to see how the Ololoros develop um, this sort of green season. We call it green season because of the rains that come through. Um, so while the migration is away, <clears throat> it's going to be very interesting over the next five, six months how they are able to actually be able to sort of deal and cope with the food aspect and how much food they're going to need. I would imagine they're going to have to start turning their attention not only to these guys, but also to things like giraffe. Now, I was saying the, the lions here in the Mara are not as adept to hunting buffalo, but down south in South Africa, the pride that James is delving into the Inkuhumas, well, they're absolute professionals at bringing these guys down. I think Tristan's being a little unkind to some of the lions in the Mara. Yes, they are pretty proficient at bringing down buffalo. They do miss a lot as well, though, and I think they probably eat quite a lot else besides buffalo. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to show you, I think it's four clips during the course of the next little while, of the Inkuhuma pride on the hunt. We are going to try and sort of unpack their tactics, some of the things that works for them and some of the things that doesn't, and uh, some of the things that doesn't, th some of the things that don't, and and we'll also look at some of their successes and some of their failures. The first thing we're going to do, however, is get a view of them from above on the hunt at night. There we are. Now, this is quite a long clip, so we may fast forward through some of it. But what's quite nice here is that is the entire pride. The resolution of this picture is not great because that's what we that's all we can produce basically with a thermal camera at night. Uh, slowly things will get a little bit better but there's nothing wrong with your picture that's just what it looks like. That is the entire Nkuhuma pride on the hunt using a FLIR thermal camera on, in fact, I don't think it is a FLIR, but it is a thermal camera on the end of a drone in the evening, flown by the great French Gabonese Air Force pilot Sebastien Rombi. Can you stop there, please? Oh, I love being able to do that. It's wonderful. On the left hand side, just above this rather enthusiastic title that you have at the bottom of the screen, you can see the lion or the line of lions moving. The lioness in front there, I suspect very strongly, is the oldest lioness. Whenever I've seen these pri this pride get up, you can move it on now. Whenever I've seen this pride get on or get up and move as the sun goes down, she almost always leads them out, and I think that's her. Now, slowly and periodically, you will see the pride moving out from side to side, just kind of fanning out, probably picking up bits and pieces on the wind and then slowly they converge again and come back together. And it's only once they actually manage to home in on a target that they set the famous horns of the buffalo or pincer movement, which I will show you in a little while. There you can see they've rejoined. There's always a little bit of mutual grooming, especially as there are some youngsters in the pride. And again, I suspect very strongly, obviously it's impossible to tell from here, but right up front there is that oldest lioness, now, when I have watched them, it's been the oldest lioness followed by normally amber eyes and then the others following on from there. And then you can see she's leading the rest of them off after they've been investigating something, having a bit of a greeting session. And again, the business-like focus being brought to the hunt is the oldest lioness. Now... How do we know that they're hunting here? Well, you can see them splitting up from time to time, but this is very clearly not a territorial patrol. They're investigating bits and pieces in and out and through the bushes. They're hoping to find something to eat. Stop there a sec. Can you go back four frames? Uh, that stop. Now, watch. The, there's a gap of purple top middle of your screen, play now, and you'll see a scrub hair bursting across it. There you go. That's quite cute. Probably totally unaware of the lions coming past it, just going about its business, but that gives you an idea of the size of a scrub hair on the thermal drone. Fair you say they look like sausages uh, that are connected together. I think they look like small maggots moving across a plain of uh, caramel. But yes, sausages all stuck together. Now that do seem, there's another little, uh, looks like a scrub hair running off top right. Okay. Here we go. You can see it moving away there. Little scrubby. Off we go. Okay, let's carry on. 
And we're now, okay, right, so now we've moved into a hunt situation. Let's just stop there. Go back a sec until the very beginning. Now, in theory, this hunt happened just after we saw them moving there, but they did not set the pincer movement correctly, quite correctly here, and I'll show you how and why just now. This is quarantine clearings that they're on now. It's a very open area. You can see that there are a lot of antelope. You probably can't see that. You probably can't tell what on earth's going on here. Stop this. Just stop a sec. All of that stuff to the right-hand side of the road there is basically everything to the right-hand side. If we can... Yeah, that's not going to work. No. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Uh, everything to the right-hand side of your picture on the right-hand side of the road is antelope, so wildebeest, and there are impala there. That thing on the left, just don't move the pick if you don't mind, is a lion. So middle of the picture is a lion. And if we just roll it slowly forward from there, you can see the hunt is on. Okay, so the lion is giving chase. Everything is running away. It's madness. Now, stop there. You can see that the animals here don't know where all the lions are. All they know is that they're being chased by, from, by one lion from one direction. They don't know where the rest of the cats are, and interestingly, nor do you. Let's play this on slowly. Okay, stop. Middle of your screen are three wildebeest. Okay, you can see them there, the three wildebeest. To the left of them is an impala. Let's play slowly from there. The wildebeest are in a flat panic. There's another wildebeest, there's a calf. Now stop there. There is the ambush. On your right-hand side, or on the right-hand side of the picture, there is a small hot sausage you can see, sort of just above the T and to the right. You might be able to see that. That there is a lioness. Now watch what the antelope have no idea that she's there. Watch what happens here. They turn towards her and then she goes. There she goes, through a bush, probably bangs her head, and she's after them. And then there's another lioness that's going to appear from the bottom of your screen and that's going to make them turn the other way. You can see them suddenly increase in speed and there it comes, just underneath the A of Nkuhuma. All right, so that was the hunt. Let's just go back again once more to where, those sausage, where the sausage was lying on the ground, if you don't mind. There we go. Very nice. Okay, no other lions in sight. The one that was chasing from the left has now given up the hunt. She has done her job. She's chased them into this ambush. Now the sausage is waiting, but there's another one. The one that eventually ends up underneath the A of the Ngohuma is too far back, and she's too far to the right-hand side. If she had been lying to the right and top of the lioness that eventually gives chase, I think they'd have had some luck, but the reason that I suspect she didn't do that is that there is no cover there. So that's very short grass, and you can see that from the temperature of the ground. Let's play from there. There we go, she gives chase. One of them is completely confused, and now she doesn't really know which one to chase. There she goes, and in comes the other one from the side. She nearly got hold of one of them. So maybe she wasn't necessarily in a bad position there. Maybe her positioning was okay. <laughs> so that's quite fun, I think. All right, so that's what was happening there. We had one line is, I could probably draw it for you, and probably will do that in our next segment. I'll draw for you exactly what happened there. But the movement was set up quite nicely with the lioness chasing into an ambush that almost worked. I think the lack of cover and the very short grass up on those clearings worked for or to the advantage of the prey and against the poor old lions of the Unkuhuma pride. I'll set up a little drawing for you because I know you love me to draw. <laughs> Let's go over to Chitwa Chitwa where Sydney I think is probably having a swim. I have got something here. It looks like a dead log at the moment, but the bears are not landing on it. Uh, you can see the shape that this is the crocodile. 
So this crocodile is dry on top of the head, but the side of the body, is, it looks very wet. So the temperatures, when they're too hot, you will see the crocodiles coming out, opening their mouth in order to get rid of the warmth. So this can be a very dangerous animal. So crocodiles, they uh, are also very territorial. You will see them mostly at the same water holes, but sometimes when the females are active, that is not this noise from the crocodiles. Crocodiles, they also make that kind of a noise. So when the females are active in some of the nearest water holes, they can leave their water holes to go and visit them. So here where we are, this is the Chitwa Chitwa water hole. And something very interesting about Chitwa Chitwa as an area is that not very long time ago, we have witnessed the Duke of Juma at Tingana patrolling his territory all the way down to Chitwa Chitwa. Here is Tingana. The Duke continued the expansion of his dukedom this week. Is tiring work and he took a bit of time for some self pampering. He secured Central Juma first before moving on to Chitwa. We haven't seen him marking that far south for some time. He assessed the area and then, with his supreme confidence, set off into the evening to declare his dominance. So I have got the two completely different species and both territorial. The hippopotamus, they are right here by the Chitra Chitra water hole as well as the crocodile. So the maintenance of the territory is very much important to the territorial animals. The Duke of Juma, Tingana, must have to keep coming back to this area now to renew the scent. He was last seen in this area a long time ago, but now he still think that this area belongs to him and he must have to revive it and bring back the scent in order to advertise his dominance in the area. So you can see the, the hippopotamus is just about to uh, come out there. Maybe he wants to uh, come and relax by the bank. So it it's not the perfect time now for them to go out for feeding. <laughs> uh, Catherine, I am with you on that. I am also in love too much with how a Hosanna does his sewing. It is lovely. Uh, Tingana does his sewing. My apologies for that, Hosanna. We haven't yet heard him sewing. Uh, Tingana, the Duke of Juma. Thank you very much to uh, Dave, my camera operator, for picking that up. So you can see the hippopotamus are enjoying themselves at the moment. So now uh, let's uh, cross over to David, who's got uh, some elephants at the moment. I will be here by the Chitwa Chitwa waiting to see if this will be something interesting. Well, I think there's nothing special than hearing or seeing a leopard so when you hear them go, uh, 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 uh. well, we've got elephants here that are doing a mud bath and you can tell this will help them to cool off and above all, should they have any insects or rather should they have any parasites like, you know, ticks, they're going just to make sure it's all covered by the mud. And the whole idea, I just want to go a little bit closer and see whether you can hear them flushing the water on their bodies because the whole idea is just to cool off and it's not very hot as far as I'm concerned, but they sense temperatures differently the nuts are going to stop there, not go very close and invade their space. And you see them, even the young one is being shown by these big ones how to cool off. Ideally, the lorries use their ears to flap when it's very hot, but any time they get a pan of water like this, they will take advantage of it. See that one there? How cool is that? 
and sometimes the small one on the other side just trying to roll and wallow in the mud. You see that one below the legs of those ones? If she cannot throw a lot of water on her body, she just gets inside the jacuzzi herself. Well, you could go, you'd like to know what do elephants do when it trains. Now, I'll let you know first, we have the short trains at the moment in the Mara Triangle. And elephants do not look worried at all by the rains. They'll keep feeding, they'll keep moving, and just doing their normal thing as usual. I would say it's a very big plus for the elephants when it rains because it helps them cool off. Look at the size of their bodies. It's so huge, and they'll always have a challenge to try and cool that huge body. And exactly as you can see there, they'll get the mud and the dirty water, not dirty per se, to throw on their bodies and especially on their bellies to cool off. If it rains, they will not bother doing that a lot. But I also believe they enjoy being in the water. Look at those two there. And the other one of them, the big one is trying to show truly he is a boy and not a girl. It's always very difficult sometimes to tell males from females when they're fully grown unless you see the mammary glands. At this particular age, you need to look very carefully between the hind legs or you need to look on their forehead to see the male. So that one is definitely a male. And males, as they mature, their body morphology will clearly show a rounded head or a rounded forehead. So it needs to cool a lot than the rest of the herd. And you see the tusks now will look very muddy. How was that? Sometimes they just swing their head when they see us, like, what's up, you know? See, you know, the clean tusks when she got, he got there, the very white but not anymore full of mud now but I'm sure as soon as it rains it'll get clean again remember our drive is very interactive when you ask us questions or as you send through comments you give us a lot of happiness and you can always do that on Twitter using hashtag safari live or you can keep following us on the YouTube chat stream just trying to have a little rub there on the ear or on the eyes what are you doing? I think you're just putting more mud you're putting more mud on your eyes. Well, you need to see, and definitely after having cooled off now, they'll need to go back or go grazing or eating the forest behind there. Well, we'll go back to South Africa because James, I'm sure, want to tell us something. Yes, uh, yes, David, I do want to tell something to our wonderful viewers. Thank you for that superb introduction to what I'm going to say. I suspect you were just rather too shocked at the thought that I'd been allowed to draw again. Here we have a beautiful rendition of what we saw earlier. I'm sure that to many of you this must look like a photograph of lions and wildebeest and some vegetation. It isn't a photograph. I drew it while you were off air, or while I was off air. This is what we saw. There are the three wildebeest. You can see them. They have horns and they are black. Here are the lions. They are green for some reason. I'm not sure why. It's because the only thing I have is a green thing. So what we had was this lioness here, and I think one of them was further back. She, I don't know, obviously couldn't tell which one it was, charging towards the wildebeest. The wildebeest got a fright. They ran away. Obviously, there were a whole lot of antelope fleeing in all directions but she homed in on these three, possibly because of their size. They're a perfect size meal, actually, for this pride. Everything went sort of according to plan, except for the fact that this is all clear, and the grass is so short that there is nowhere for a lion to hide, especially not on a relatively bright night. So the wildebeest probably sensed this lion, and they headed off in that direction there, and this lion then gave chase. She managed to get them to come around towards this lioness here. But by then, it was too late because the space between them was too great. And so she did give chase and the wildebeest headed off into the, basically into the bush to the south of quarantine or to the east of quarantine. If she had managed to start the hunt over here, had there been sufficient cover, I think the ambush would have been perfectly set. I suspect there was another lioness just further behind over there. So that's what I think happened. Hmm. Yes, very good. Uh, Shamsan, I am not sure if the young Nkuhumas have successfully made a kill. I pretty much 
I mean, I, I assume they must have. The, some of them are two and a half years old now. And yeah, they must be helping with the kills. Even if they're not leading them, they will certainly be helping once an animal's down or once an animal has been taken. All righty, now, we did show you there a full chase of a pride on the hunt, setting an ambush. It was great to watch. Let's go and see, uh, well, something slightly less competent. I, it, this, this sort of reminds me of the times when I used to go to the fridge as a student. In a student digs is what we call them in South Africa. You'd open the fridge and there'd be absolutely nothing in it except one punnet of very mouldy margarine. For now, the Talamati young male is officially on his own. No longer for him the privilege of simply helping himself at the pride's pantry. Now, like a young human finally booted from home, he must support himself. A task that is proving somewhat difficult. While he looks very good on the hunt, his appreciation of the need for cover is poor. He's taken to drinking. To be fair, it has been hot. And clearly, he's making some poor dietary choices. That said, he still looks in good health. I was being slightly facetious there, of course, suggesting that the Inkahuma Prior, uh, that the Talamati male had taken to drink. Uh, of course, that's what students do. They don't spend their money on food, they spend it on drink, which, of course, is not what the Talamati male is doing there. It was just very hot. <laughs> and, Monique, you say you feel queasy after that. Now, I remember, actually, one of the very first things that got me interested in wildlife. I was sitting late one evening at home. I'd just been f doing my homework. It was some horrendously boring essay in something or other. And my father came through and he said, you want some tea? So I said, yes, I'll have some tea. And we went through to the sitting room to have some tea and flicked the TV on. And there was a, I remember it very clearly, there was a documentary on, we very seldom watch documentaries, but it was this young male lion trying to learn to hunt. And I think it was shot in the Kalahari, and I think it was shot by a chap called Tim Liversidge, he's a very famous wildlife filmmaker in that area. And it showed again and again a young male lion exactly the same age as that one there, trying to catch and trying desperately to feed himself in the absence of a pride. And I've always remembered that. And it just reminded me of A, a being a student, uh, that clip and that very first kind of video that I enjoyed. All righty. So that was the Talamati male on the hunt. Not very successfully. Let's go across to Oily, who is also not being particularly successful on the hunt. Yes, James. Luckily, the Talamati was hunting, but it didn't have a luck to get the uh, antelope. So I'm uh, driving around. Hopefully, I'll see the Inkuhuma males or Inkuhuma pride. I mean, sorry about that. So the no tracks yet. So I. My plan was to drive to to a hyena den. I won't try any chance to go to a hyena den around this time because it's hot. So hyenas avoid to go to, to their den site around this time. So I'll wait for the sun to go down and then I'll go and look for any activity happening there. So the Inkuhumas have been, it's been a couple of days without the Inkuhumas in the reserve so i'm trying my luck to move from pen to dam to the dry river beds to check whether i will be lucky to find any fresh tracks or any thing to find these lines shout is this my f the first cat i've seen on safari live I'm not oh 
Oh, what's the first cat I've seen in Kenya? Oh, that's, that's the question there. Yeah, I, and I, I uh, believe I, I got it right. The first cat I've seen in, in Kenya was uh, a uh, several cat. The spotted cat that looked more like a leopard than a cheetah, but it's more or less smaller than those cats. It's a beautiful cat that hunts very unique. It's a cat that I love to see every day because of its spots and its coat. So while I'm searching for the lions, let's go to Sydney. I've got one of the very, very special sighting here. There is a sounder of warthogs with quite a lot of small babies. A stationary sighting like this of the white of the warthogs in Juma is very rare. I have tried by all means on several occasions to have the warthog stable, but it's always difficult. So you can see now that they are very much stable and they are feeding on some of the green grass. So you will see this kind of animals when they want to access the ground, like what we are seeing on that one. You can see uh, she is on her knees. So you can see that uh, she's on her knees. When, when she, they want to uh, have a good accessibility to the grass, this is what they do. So this kind of animals, you will see them coming out. They are so cute. Uh, that is uh, true indeed. Look at that. Look at those babies. So what, what talks, how they get back to their den is interesting. They always go back in reverse, always ready to charge their intruders. You have to be very careful when approaching the artifact holes because those are the kind of uh, accommodation they use the most. So they eat the leaves and they also eat the rhizomes. The rhizomes are the roots from some of the grasses. So look at that. So the females, they have got one watts and the males have got two watts. So this animal confuses a lot of people with the bush pig. So the bush pig is also active sometimes during the day, but normally bush pig is active at night. Warthog, they are active during the day. And the bush pigs, they are very hairy. Warthogs, they have got little hairs. And bush pigs, they don't lift up the tails when running away from danger. Whereas the warthogs lift up the tails. Look at these babies, they are cute. Look at that. And these babies can be so fast. So they can litter up to four babies that can reach a maximum of eight. So now from the uh, warthogs, let's cross over to one of those animals with a hard skin like the warthog, the hippopotamus. Well, as you can see, we are sitting with a hippo that doesn't look very good at all. The poor thing has seemingly been attacked by another hippo at some point in life and has been scarred and is not looking very healthy, I'm afraid. Lots and lots of battle scars there and, and looking quite skinny. But it's eating with relish and so hopefully we're going to get a situation where if it gets a little bit more food in, it will start to kind of... Um, bulk up again and, and be able to recover. Hippos are incredibly hardy animals and they'll often be able to get past these kind of wounds. You'll often see the scratches and things and I wouldn't be surprised that they've even had a bit of a go from hyenas and, and even lions in its condition being as weak as it is. Now these kind of wounds and scars and scrapes that you see like this is quite common when you've had a period of very dry weather. So what would have happened with this guy is probably in all likelihood, um, as it got drier and drier, so the Mara River particularly kind of got smaller and smaller and smaller and the pools where hippos could live got smaller and therefore there was competition that's taken place. And the more dominant and bigger individuals have then bullied this fella a little bit and bitten him and scratched him and, and probably very lucky to actually get away with his life at this stage because often what happens when they get bitten up like this is that they can end up getting 
very, very, very badly injured. It, you know, one of those tusks can penetrate the stomach area and into the internal organs, and you can get. That's how a lot of people actually die. Now, I believe a lot of you are feeling sorry for it. It, it, and it is always a sorry thing when you see an animal that is in a bit of a bad way. But the rains might have arrived just in time to get this fellow back up on its feet and able to start kind of figuring life out again and bulking up and regaining some condition not only will it have provided a lot of places for this hippo to spend um, days um, away from the rest of the hippos where it's not going to get nearly as much of a, a, or attention from bigger males but it's also going to have a lot more green grass to eat which is going to be full of nutrients and it's going to allow this um, his body to to recuperate and and for his condition to improve quite a bit but shame eating a lot and already early in the evening is up and moving and you can see he must have had a really bad gash on that front leg you can see actually where it's kind of healed and scarred so that front left there's a big 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 scar there that's closed up and that must have been a huge gaping wound at some point now this hippo is busy feeding around and taking it easy um, and you, I was saying that hyenas might have had a go at it when it was at its weakest and that's because we're in an area very close to where the happy zebras hang out in fact on the divide between the happy zebras and the north clan which is not a good place to be if you're an ailing animal but recently we spent a little bit of time with the happy zebras and it was really nice to see that they've got some new additions Out of the many characters we see on Safari Live, none have a name that makes me smile more than that of the Happy Zebra Clan. The name is rather ironic, as I'm sure no zebra is happy when they are around. We have not been seeing much of the clan in the past few months, but with us spending more time around the burn section lately, we have found a few sightings of the various clan members. They roam the open burn section in search of food. The green flush after the recent rains means there's a plethora of animals to choose from. This week their tactic of trolling this section of the park was rewarded. We found them finishing off what was left of a kill that the lions had made. The intriguing part was the fact that we had found them in the exact same spot two days in a row. The reason was soon revealed as we stumbled upon a female with two cubs at a den. The two seem to have endless amounts of energy and we look forward to spending time with them in the future. Well, absolutely wonderful to have spent some time with those little ones. They were full of energy and it was such a kind of epic sighting in that we had lions roaring in the background quite close by that we eventually found. We had lightning in the distance and these two little hyenas that were charging around all over the place being very, very kind of playful and kind of running up and down to mom and then down into their little burrow and back up again. So absolutely wonderful to spend time at hyena dens. They certainly do change the perspective that a lot of people have over hyenas and I think the North Clan has done a lot um, to kind of change that along with Jamie. Jamie's always very good with kind of doing the hyenas dynamics and then introducing these little characters to all of us and making them kind of feel a lot more or a lot less like the Lion King has made people feel about them so it's always good to spend time at a den and I always say it's just the, one of the first places you should take guests if they ever have something negative to say about hyenas because they will learn very quickly how special they can actually be. Kulsix, yes, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the happy zebra have names um, and have identifying sort of features and those kind of things. We just haven't that one really difficult to keep on top of in the form of the North Clan. It's already quite tricky to kind of remember all of them and so we just haven't spent time in the area that the Happy Zebras um, spend most of their time. We've had a few kind of epic sightings of them, um, hunting buffalo and, and obviously interacting with the Owino pride, but we haven't spent nearly the same amount of energy and time with them as we have with North Clan and so um, there will definitely be members that have got names. Um, what those names are I'll have to find out for you um, and I'm quite keen to sort of see who's the one that has the little ones at the moment um, but it'll be good I mean we've got at least another den which is great so at the moment we know of the den for well it looks like the den for some of the Ololos, the North Clan and Happy Zebras which is which is quite nice and all of them are fairly visible and, and easy to get to which is nice except North Clan when it rains because it's never that spectacular to get to the North Clan it's always very tricky if it has rained that road is a bit of a nightmare good well we're going to move on from our hippo we're going to go try and see if we can actually get to the den it's now stopped raining thankfully which means we can open everything up and actually look better for animals and so while we do that let's send you back to James who is still discussing the Inkuhumas and their buffalo hunting techniques.
Indeed, we are going to be discussing more about the Nguhumas and their buffalo hunting. Not quite a successful hunt just yet. There we are. There is a picture of some sticks. Oh, there's a line behind it. Excellent. Right, as you can see, the theme of this clip is uh, Buffalo Fight Back. You'll know that from the fact that there are buffalo and there are some lions and the buffalo don't look like they're going to be eaten. This was taken on my sister's birthday this year, actually. That's quite interesting. All right, so what we have here is basically a situation where an entire herd of buffalo was not as intimidated by the lions as they thought they might be. So you can see if they stand in a broad phalanx, the lions will back off. Now, I've spoken a lot about this. Just pause there if you don't mind. Can you go back a sec? Keep going. That's it. Back, 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 stop. Thank you. Now, you can see there that, uh, well, I mean, how many are there there? There are at least sort of 10 buffalo are now giving chase to the lions. There is no lion I have ever seen that is going to stand down a charge like that. They will always run. Now, I've spoken quite a lot about this in the last few weeks. I do not understand, well, I think I do understand, but uh, at the on the surface level, it looks odd to me that, and possibly to you, that buffalo should ever eat lions because this is what they do if you if they just stand as a united front the lions run away so if you play from there there we are no lion is going to stand his ground his or her ground in that face even one buffalo here using the protection of the bush to control what comes from behind you can see this lion is coming around the back but with the bush there to protect him, the lions are very reticent to get near the business end of those horns. Even one buffalo. There they go, and he joins the rest of the herd. Now you can see the lioness is now getting a little bit irritated. There we are. But she's not going to stand her ground. And so you've got to ask the question, how it is possible that these lions ever catch buffalo? But all of this, of course, is practice for the Yunkahuma pride. They are buffalo specialists because they are a big pride. And because they are a big pride, they need to eat big meals. And the biggest meals they can get out here are either buffalo or giraffe. There are not that many giraffe around. They have killed one or two in that time, but mostly it's buffalo. And all of that toing and froing is a way of finding a weakness, of trying to get the rest of the herd to panic and run away, and then they can single out one. And we'll see how they do that a little bit later. Just interestingly, onto the buffalo side of things, why don't they stand as a united front? You can see that it works, and there's no reason why they should ever really be eaten by lions. The reason, from a biological point of view, I believe, is that they don't need to. For the species, it doesn't. Their breeding success is such that the number of buffalo lost to lion predation is not sufficient to drive their numbers downward to the extent that there's an evolutionary pressure for them to stand down those charges. And I think that's why you find that they don't do it all the time, because really there's no reason for them to be eaten at all. The lions there trying, each of them trying to get round a, uh, the back, never going for the front. It's only when the, lion, or when the buffalo either gets tired or runs that they then jump on the back. Now, Lycan Pictus says it's very similar with wolves and bison, apparently, that the wolves will try and get around the back end <clears throat> and try and stay away from the the bison's uh, horns and possibly also uh, they're unable to take down a bison unless they run and they're able to then tire it out. It's It's fascinating. And, of course, trying to get around the back end of an enemy is something that all of these predators do. The lions do it to each other when they're fighting. The hyenas do it to lions. Nobody wants to get at the front end of a horned buffalo or a toothed lion or hyena. So fascinating stuff there. We'll take it a little bit further a little bit later. Let's, for now, go to David Kathambagithu, who has got a bird that I don't believe the Nkuhumas have ever eaten. Well, I haven't found my black rhino yet, but I've found a very special bird here, and this is the Maasai ostrich. 
I'm saying it's pretty special because sometimes they just become elusive and we rarely see them. And seeing this male here, if you look at him carefully, and I'm calling it a male because sometimes when we come to sexual dimorphism of certain birds, it's rather tricky, but ostriches, the males are black and white on their feathers, while the females are grayish, brownish in color. You do not make a mistake when it comes to telling the difference between the males and the female. I'm saying this one is particularly special because it's got very pink legs and neck all the way to the head, which of course are not covered by any feathers because I guess he is in what would call a breeding plumage. And what would happen is, should he be lucky or should he bump into some females, what will happen is they'll all be very much attracted to him because he is in the right particular shape to start mating with the females. Well, these birds are very fast and the first thing they do when it comes to speed for defense is speed when it comes to defense is speed they're very fast and I've always compared them to particular mammals here in Africa in terms of speed and basically they would run as fast as the ostriches when the migration flocked to the Mara Triangle Kenya moved to the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. Our last sighting of her was around July of this year, and she had six cubs. The wildebeest have since moved back to Tanzania, and Kenya has graced the Mara Triangle once more. When we saw her last week, she unfortunately did not have a single cub. Nobody knows what happened to them. She had a bad year. However, we hope she will stick around and produce more offspring. Enjoying the onset of the short trains. She seemed full of energy and maybe scanning the savanna for a possible mate. Welcome back live and we have all the good news about Kenya. Kenya is that female cheetah you just saw there who for quite some time since July she has been missing in action. She just came back and as I said pretty sad news because when she left she had about six cubs and when she came back she did not have any and between July and now it's six months it takes about 18 months or about a year and a half for a mother cheetah to you know have the cubs graduating or to be independent on their own six months was definitely not the right age and so many things would have gone wrong but again that's what happens here in the wilderness well a busy ostrich either feeding on some seeds there or some leaves or some flowers from the grass and it has been always the proverbial myth that ostriches will always bury their heads in the sand but maybe one of the theories or reasons for saying that they bury their heads in the sun is because when you see them feeding they'll always have their heads in the grass or in the ground. Sometimes they could be picking some seeds, I mean some pebbles or even uh, sand which would help them for digestion. They have a very special stomach that we call the gizzard which is very muscular stomach and because it doesn't contract as much and there's not much, I would say, enzymes or gastric juices to digest what they eat. They'll always swallow some sand and some pebbles to help grind all what they eat before it goes to the main crop and then out of the body. Well, I need to try and keep my word earlier where I said I'll be looking for a rhino. And this is one area I saw one rhino yesterday. Really, it's very sad because Kenya is such a beautiful cheetah, she's just a beautiful mother. And the last she was seen, I'm talking about July, she had six cubs. A lot would have happened. And July, it was just the time the migration was coming in Kenya or in the Mara Triangle. And we initially guessed because she had the small little cubs, she, the lions tend to follow the migration and cubs, or, la, or rather cats, to compete with each other and maybe she guessed with the migration coming in 
and the lions following the, the migration or the wildebeest, there could be a tendency or there could be a possibility of the lions seeing the calves and maybe going for them. So we were guessing widely that she decided to go to Serengeti with her cubs and avoid the wildebeest and the lions. And the wildebeest now having gone back to Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, she decided to come back, which is a good thing. But now she came back minus the cubs. A lot of things would have happened. Nobody knows for a fact what happened, but we can always guess predators, lions maybe, leopards maybe, hyenas maybe, or maybe she tried to cross the Ma River. I lost that question from Sanju. I was just going to watch this ostrich again. Please bring me that question again. Sanju, very good question, and you'd like to know what's the main prey for Kakenya? Cheetahs in general, including Kakenya, the main prey will be the Thompson gazelles. Antelopes are the main prey, and I would say 50 60% Kakenya have always been dealing with Thompson gazelles. I would say the Tommies of the Thompson gazelles, what sometimes they call the Tommies, they are soft and they are tender and cheetahs in general have been known to go for antelopes and again as i said 56 percent of the prey will be the thompson gazelles the mara triangle in the serengeti national park is full of thompson gazelles there's so many of them and i would say nine out of ten you know nine out of ten times i've seen kakenya hunting she has always gone for a Thompson gazelle. Well, Sydney, back in South Africa, is just around the dam and she got something interesting. He got something interesting with him. I have got something unusual. This is very interesting. The two hornbills are busy eating the elephant dungs. So they were both sharing the very same elephant dung and now each one of them is having its own dung ball. So you can see that uh, they are very busy at the moment. They must be getting some of the uh, insects in there. So this is what is called a caprophagic behavior. When an animal is eating the other one's droppings, so it's called caprophagias. You can see the other one wants to start a new one. So they are very busy destroying this. So they are helping to disperse uh, the uh, elephant droppings, which will benefit the soil because it will easily get decomposed. So the, the beak for these birds, it works a lot in order to kill the animals such as the scorpions. You will see them killing the scorpions and they use the very same beak in order to regulate the body temperature. So the beak of these birds helps them to get rid of the heat. Not only the hornbills but all the birds. So you can see that uh, they're not going to finish eating uh, these uh, droppings now. This is something very rare. I've seen birds eating droppings of the other one and dispersing to get the seeds and to get some of the insects. But now it looks like uh, they are done. So this, these birds, they battle too much in order to get water because they are big it cannot easily collect water. So that's why they concentrate on quite a lot of uh, soft, the soft prey, the insects, which has got a lot of uh, water inside. So now let's cross over to the Masai Mara and see what's happening at the moment. I have morphed away to the Masai Mara. Isn't it wonderful here in the Masai Mara? Marcel, are you enjoying being in the Masai Mara? He says he's really enjoying it a lot here in the Masai Mara. It really was a quick trip. Normally it takes much longer than the five minutes it took us, but we're very quick. Good. That whole story Sydney was telling you about the beaks and heat, heat regulation, I sort of did a double take when he said it, and I thought, I'm not sure that that's accurate. And I checked it up, and sure as nuts, it is accurate, absolutely. The birds' bills are, in fact, uh, used for heat regulation. I had absolutely no idea until right about now. Well done, Sitters. Thank you very much for that. We do learn something from each other. Oh, maybe not every day, but certainly some days.
Now we're going to move on to, I think, our next Nguhuma uh, sort of uh, buffalo hunting expedition. Let's have a look at it now. There you can see one of the Nguhumas is taking riding lessons. She isn't actually, she's really trying to kill that buffalo. And as you can see, I, I love how the, the titles on these videos, just pause it there. The title on the video here uh, tells you exactly what's going to happen. There's no sort of surprise going on here, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so let's play on. And we have a young bull, probably still about 20% off his maximum mass, and a lion now on his back and the rest trying to avoid it. Now pause there. I just keep playing a little bit till we can get a full frontal face on of that lioness. There we go. Oh, yeah, all right. So that that's the... There we go. Just keep zooming in there. That's it. That is the ridge-nosed lioness of the Inkahumas. And the ridge-nosed lioness was born in 2012. And so in this particular hunt, she was only four. So it's quite a young pride at this stage. Remember, this is just post the Birmingham takeover where they had one experienced lioness with them and that was the oldest one. So let's play on from here. And you can see the rest very reticent. And then, I think that's her there. I think that's the oldest lioness at the right-hand side of the buffalo now. No, 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 sorry, not her. There we go, there. Watch as the swap over happens. I think that's the oldest lioness there. She doesn't have her injury yet, and now she's helping out. Now, can you just pause there? Imagine the terror that this buffalo is feeling. Right now, the hormones of stress are coursing through that animal's body. Just above its kidneys, its adrenal glands are in overdrive, producing adrenaline, or as you call it in the States, epinephrine, norepinephrine or noradrenaline, glucocorticoids, all sorts of things are now coursing through that animal's body. Its heart rate is soaring as a result of those hormones. Its pain receptors are dulled, absolutely. And it's in a totally almost automatic stress response here. You'll probably find that after this incident, it remembered very little of what happened. And then only the pain of the injury on its back would have uh, sort of become noticeable, I suppose. All right, let's carry on. I mean, look at this. I mean, there's an absolutely horrendous trauma this buffalo is being forced to take. Hosami, if we just pause there, you say it was a cool swap over. It was a cool swap over. I don't think that these lionesses here are being particularly serious. And I think that the reason for their lack of seriousness is, in fact, that they are so inexperienced. So here we have the five lionesses. At this stage in 2016, one of them is two years old. One of them is three, that's amber eyes, and two of them are four, and one of them is a bit older. The oldest lioness there is eight. And I just don't think that they had quite managed to sort themselves out. Remember, they'd been decimated by the Birmingham boys, and they just weren't quite as adept as they are now at lion hunting. So let's play on from there. Trying to bust the spine there. Let's stop there. She's digging her canines into the spine, trying to sever the spinal cord. But of course, buffalo and in fact many herbivores are blessed with a fairly fatty piece of meat just above the shoulders there. And that helps them, I suspect, to protect or does help them to defend themselves against this sort of attack. She's biting into it, she's breaking the skin, she's driving those canines in there, but she's not managing to get between the vertebra. <laughs> Trish, uh, I don't think, did I say just practicing? I don't think they're practicing. I think they're definitely trying to kill here, but I don't think they've had much practice by this stage of the pride's existence. See how they're standing a bit confused, not really knowing what to do, and eventually they, they give up. I mean, I cannot see the pride at the, the, its current iteration letting go of a young bull like that, especially when they had him and they weren't being attacked. Then, of course, the big cheese comes in. He's obviously heard the distress bellows of the buffalo. And even though he's a young bull, the lions are not going to stand around. 
Now you can see one of them is lactating there. I'd forgotten about that. She's lactating. And the rest of them scarpering. Even they, they were very hungry. So I think that's a rather fascinating look at them hunting. Again, I think the Unkahuma pride much younger than they are now. I cannot see those five lionesses letting go of an opportunity like that. That was ideal. I think they would have closed in more and tried to hamstring the buffalo quickly and get it down, especially while they had one on top, and then I think one would have gone for the nose. That would have been an inexperienced buffalo bull, and I'm really not sure that he would have been able to defend himself like he did there in the face of a full-blooded Unkuhuma attack uh, from the pride as it sits at the moment. And of course now they've got the six youngsters with them and I think they too will learn to uh, get onto the buffalo much faster than they were doing there. And they have the young male, the, shall we call him, junior number two. That's not his name, don't worry. Junior number two, who is going to help them with big animals there. Now, many of you obviously thinking that is very hard to watch, not thinking, knowing that that was very hard to watch, because it is hard to watch. And I must say, I thought I would become more and more inured to that sort of thing. I find it more and more difficult to watch as I go on with my career in the bush. But, of course, I knew that one was going to escape because the, uh, the heading said buffalo was going to escape so that's good i will warn you that the next one isn't quite so lucky anyway let us go across to tristan he has now of course found himself some water in the short rains of the masai mara right now as you can see we are still getting absolutely pelted by rain i have no idea how Every time I try and touch this roof when it stops raining, it just starts again. It's kind of one of those things. As soon as there is, it seems like a break, we start to unravel all the covers and try and open things out. That's why we've got one side that's open. And then it just starts, it's nonsense once again. And it's irritating because the weather, while it's nice that it's raining, but the, the light is so incredible, as you can probably see through this windscreen, that it would be so nice to be driving now without any sort of obstruction at all but we can stop at least for a Quran for the meantime while it's raining because otherwise I'm just going to get too frustrated to actually deal with this nonsense it's like I say highly irritating that it just keeps raining all the time I don't even know where the water is coming from at this stage most of the clouds have left us and it just seems to have followed us wherever we've gone and we've tried to turn away from the storm it's just going to come with us and kind of followed through but you can see our Quran's not really too phased by it. It's probably quite happy, actually, given that generally after rain is followed by a lot of um, insect activity, and these guys will be thoroughly happy by that because that will allow them to be able to kind of eat and, and go and find all kinds of little tasty morsels. If you're a Quran, I suppose an insect is a speciality and a tasty morsel in its own right but they'll see what they'll do is they'll kind of tuck up like this and head will be down they won't really expose themselves too much um, they don't want to get everything kind of too damp and they'll keep the wings closed and then if they once it dries out or stops raining then you'll see that they'll start to move around and they'll dry out a little bit and the good news you say it's big breasted <laughs> Yes, I suppose it is, isn't it? And it is a girl, so she's obviously uh, quite happy to be big-breasted. And you'll find that what's happened is just it, it's basically let its feathers expand slightly or raised its feathers, and that's all just to trap air against the body and just try and keep itself as warm as possible. They don't have the luxury of having a roof over their heads, and so that will help with just aiding to, to be as kind of warm as possible in an otherwise quite chilly afternoon. It's, once you wet out here and if there's a bit of a breeze, it can be very, very chilly indeed. I want to try and see, I mean, at the risk of getting stuck because this road is wetter than I could ever imagine. I don't know where all this rain came from. I want to try and show you guys the sunset that we've got. So Manu, let's try and do a maneuver here. It's going to be quite tricky, but we're going to see what we can do. Because there is buffalo and there is a whole massive orange ball of light that is coming down at the moment. And I've got to be a bit careful here because it's rained so much that the edges of the road themselves are very, very wet and sticky. In fact, we would have probably a bit of a tricky time if we were to go anywhere. But how is that for beautiful? That is, the sun just kind of slipped underneath the storm. And so you've got this 
golden golden kind of light um, and then there's a few buffalo that are sort of just below them which are probably quite tricky for you guys to see it's too bright for us to be able to probably expose for the buffalo and the sun but you can just make them out kind of feeding across this burnt open section um, so far no sign of Happy Zebra Clan or Kikenya anywhere here. Not that we've been able to see much because we've had our covers down most of the time. And when they down, it really is tricky to actually find any animals because you've got a field of view of about sort of, I don't know what, maybe 40 degrees in front of you um, through a windscreen that's got water droplets all over it, which makes spotting animals almost impossible unless they are lying in the middle of the road. But how beautiful is that? Quite spectacular, isn't it? Right, now we're going to try and see if we can just slowly kind of go forward a little bit. Maybe we'll find something else milling about. While we do that, I appreciate the son of leaves sitting down south here is doing exactly the same as we are. So I'm trying to check here where Tristan is because the sun is going down. Maybe Mara is somewhere there where there is no sun. But here in South Africa at the moment in Juma, the sun is still high up. I can see he still have got quite a lot of time with us. This sun we are seeing now, it does give excitement to some of the plants such as the beautiful grasses. Here on the ground, I can see the grasses are very much green. Look at that. These grasses are nutritious. And when these grasses are like this, some of the animals, big cats, such as um, uh, the lepers, they come here and eat this. Let's see what has been happening not long time ago. During the week, while Tingana roamed his territory in the east, he seemed to be on the search for a meal. A little did we know what he desired was a light salad. Watching the leopard as he snapped away at the defenseless grass was something to behold. So you can see that uh, here, this grass is, uh, has got quite a lot of long leaves. I'm just going to take one here for us uh, to see. So these are the leaves uh, Tingana was eating. But what is it that Tingana is looking for here? When the cats such as Tingana has got problems in the stomach, it can be a problem to do with the internal parasites such as the tapeworms or the problem with the undigestible material. The indigestible material such as the bones stuck by the digestive tract. For this cat to get rid of them, he must come and eat. It doesn't taste bad. And then, uh, this is what Tingana was doing. He is trying to get the grass juice. This grass juice has got something which is called a folic acid, which is equivalent to the vitamin B. Vitamin B, what it does in the body, it gives a lot of red blood cells and it's responsible for growth. So not only the parasites are washed away, the body is also gaining some of the requirements. This grass is not tasting bad at all. So that's why maybe other animals such as the buffaloes and other grazers are growing their big body size just from the grass without mixing with anything, grass only. Grass are very much nutritious. It's just that the cats such as Tingana, their digestive system are not suitable to digest the grass. So that's why they don't feed on them regularly. Only when they've got problems for medicinal purposes is when they use them. <laughs> yeah, this grass is so crunchy. I am still having it uh, like a chewing gum because I want to also try and absorb uh, this uh, grass juice. Uh, maybe it might assist me in the body. Hey, the, the black mamba. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. have you seen the black mamba there? Here. We saw, we saw a black mamba here. It, it's here. Have you seen that? Ooh, that black mamba is here. It's somewhere right. Yeah, there, there, you see. Yes, look at him here. Yeah. Yeah, there, 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 you see. Can you see it? Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh, that is a very long black mamba. Look at that, look at that. Look at that. Yeah, that's a big black mamba. 
Look, he's going right in the hole. Yeah, there's a hole there. <laughs> that was a lovely quick sighting of the black mamba. Not very far away from where I tasted the grass. <laughs> he was just about to cross. It's one of the very temperamental snakes, but that one to me was very calm because he didn't show any sign of aggression. <laughs> So now, uh, let's uh, quickly go back to Tristan with the buffaloes. <laughs> well, be careful, Sydney. No one wants to be caught by a black mamba, and <laughs> especially while eating grass. That won't be the best way to go, I would imagine. But anyway, we're sitting with our buffalo. As you can see, we're incredible example of a female with huge horns that go out to the side she's very very pretty rain pelting a few little calves running around as well and then that kind of setting sun in the background which is absolutely beautiful isn't that a wonderful kind of picture you can see the little calves are full of joy when it rains like this they often get quite sort of bouncy and that's a very new little one it's probably been born in the last few days it looks as though it still might be even a little bit wobbly on its feet so that will be very very new indeed now the size of this herd is quite big it's kind of stretches out from sort of our left all the way to the right hand side quite deep and in amongst them is actually some ellies as well that are in the background of that herd so there we go you can see the ellies just in the back of all of these buffalo so quite a magic kind of scene to come across so even though it's raining and it's difficult to kind of negotiate the roads at the moment and to drive around it's still incredibly beautiful and to see these guys all mixed up together is wonderful now what will happen here is that we might actually it's a good kind of herd to be with because of two reasons this kind of stormy weather sometimes if there's lions in the area they will be quite active in hunting buffalo when it's raining like this um, as well as the hyenas we know that the happy zebra clan likes to go after buffalo um, particularly these little calves and so you never know maybe if we just spend some time around here we might get lucky with something coming along and showing itself it, the rain is certainly showing itself at this stage and is coming back again with force i don't know why it, all of a sudden it's turned and come back this way but anyway it's still absolutely beautiful now we've got two of the mara's big herbivores when we saw a third one earlier and david's now going to complete them with a fourth large herbivore for this area Well, Tristan, I'll give you a warning. Be very careful the rains don't get you there because yesterday I was hammered for about one hour. And you should be careful today could be your day. Well, where I am, not a single drop of rain, but I got lots of joy because my dream for this afternoon or for this evening has become valid. As I was saying earlier when I started the show, I was saying my plan is to get a black rhino. And I did not get one, but two. I am full of joy. It's a two black rhinos, and my guess now is these two here could be a male and a female. They're quite a distance from where I am, and I'm trying to think is a male and a female. And look at that one putting her head up, and I'm happy that all of you are happy to see rhinos. Well, quite rare to see, especially the black rhinos, which are browsers and they tend to hide in the bushes and they rarely come out in open in a place like this. So I want just to back up a little bit or move forward by another few meters and so they could see them a little better because they're always very sensitive animals. Let me try from there and see what you see. They're always very sensitive. And yesterday, apparently I saw one and because it was raining so heavily, I was not able to show it to the viewers. We had power down to protect our equipment and this particular one just running round and round like a headless chicken because I think it was totally confused by the rain and you could see the amount of rain dropping or the amount of rain bouncing on his back. Now these ones are just there quietly. They don't see very well the bark rhinos but they got a wonderful sense of smell. Their eyesight is always a bit poor so we are always very careful when we go close to them. So we'll always try to steer distance from them. And as I said, I'm guessing this could be a male and a female. Browsers in general, because the other species of rhinos that we got in Africa, we call them the white rhinos, and white rhinos in general are grazers. 
you'll always see them in the open and ideally we see more white rhinos than black rhinos in Africa because these particular ones tend to remain in the thickets and you can see from what she might have picked there now she's just chewing the difference between the two species in general is not the color but the shape of the mouth or the feeding habits now these particular ones got like what you call a triangular shaped mouth while the white rhinos got square or rectangular shape not sure rectangular or square are the same I would say more rectangular shaped than square wide mouth and these ones have a triangular shaped and talking of differences in their feeding habits we call these browsers because ideally they're feeding on leaves and twigs and Hillary that's a very good question you're asking between the two which is more aggressive let me see I would say straight from my head it is the black rhino the black rhinos are quite aggressive and I'm sure Hillary you had me saying they don't see very well and for that reason when they see something and sometimes they see an object or image in, in multiple images they become very aggressive so I would say the black rhinos are more aggressive than the white rhinos none of them is good and both of them have the potential to be dangerous to human beings but here I will tell you the black rhinos are more dangerous than the white rhinos the white rhinos as you go back to the black rhinos the white rhinos tend to be used to seeing people to seeing and you know to seeing people to seeing vehicles out there but these particular ones rarely see you know traffic well I might have to leave them because they're coming towards me and I don't want them to behave differently or I don't want to affect their behavior and we'll take you back to James in the tent and he'll tell us something about cat hunting. Cats and things, yes, cats and things. More specifically, the focus of our safari lives this afternoon, the Nguhuma Pride. Now, in this next little clip, unfortunately the buffalo, I'm going to tell you, doesn't make it, but He's a very brave old warrior and he doesn't go down without a fight. And while it is sad and it's difficult to watch, of course, lions have to eat, as we keep saying, but also he does put on a tremendously brave fight. So let's appreciate him for that. Now this was in 2015, just as the Birmingham takeover was happening. And so the pride was still at full strength here. They still had the young male junior with them. There he is, standing at number two. And they managed to get through this winter woodland and isolate a buffalo bull. And I think this was the great Brent Leo Smith who was filming this. He was driving. Uh, he, his soundtrack's been cut out, so he would have been shouting very loudly at this stage. Now look at the... Just go back a second there. I want you to compare what you see here. There, that's fine. Play, just play on here. I want you to compare how the lioness jumps on the back and look at this. This is a buffalo bull at least probably 20% heavier than the one they were having a go at in the other clip. And he's bucking and doing a lot more to get rid of that lioness than the young bull did, and yet he doesn't manage to shake them off. And here you can see one of them's on the back. Stop there. Go back a sec. Keep going, 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 keep going. Stop. No, no, no. Okay. Just stop at the next, when the next cut happens. Play. Stop. Right. There you can see we've got one on the back, exactly as we did in the other scenario, except there are now three going for his hocks and trying to hamstring him. So they're trying basically to get rid of the, well, it's not actually the hamstring, it's the Achilles tendon there. They're going for his hocks one of them getting away from the horns and going for his underbelly. Now that just didn't happen with the younger bull. Remember it was a year later, or yeah, it was more than a year later, the pride had been decimated by the Nkuhuma pride, at least by the Birmingham coalition, and they didn't have Junior, the young male, anymore. He at this stage is about three, I think. Let's play from here. It's just a much more coordinated attack and eventually he's weakened enough for one of them to get onto his throat. And I can't tell which one that is and by now of course it's all over. He's immobile, he cannot swing his head, cannot bring his horns to bear and we've got, he's now starting to run out of air and that of course is going to result in a loss of consciousness, consciousness very carefully soon and as the loss of consciousness occurs so he will fall over. He's got absolutely no chance from this side. Awful. 
this point. There he goes, he goes down. Let's stop there a second. Now, normally, of course, you'd expect this to be game over. It is game over in this instance, but even were the rest of the herd to come in at this stage, he might still survive. Unfortunately, as we play on, you will see that the rest of the herd does not come back and he's left all on his own. And nice to see young Junior there. I believe he's a successful lion in the Kruger at the moment. Uh, he was there helping the pride. So that's how an, a successful buffalo hunt goes down. That's much more the style of the Inkahumas now after the, well, the kind of the bolstering of their numbers, the settling of the pride after the Birminghams have now disappeared. Of course, they've had another male takeover, but it has been much less traumatic than when the evokers arrived here. Uh, Brendan, if I remember correctly, the Inkohuma pride, and I mean, I stand to be corrected here, was eight lionesses and a number of youngsters when I arrived here in 2015. That was about three months after I arrived here. The Birminghams came in and they whacked three lionesses. They killed them. They killed three cubs uh, from the Styx Pride, actually, and then they killed lionesses out of the Nkuhuma Pride, leaving the youngest lioness, who was, uh, well, at that stage, she was born in 2014, so she was only just over a year old, actually. She managed to escape the Birmingham boys. She is now one of the five adults in the Pride. And so it left them with four relatively young, inexperienced lionesses, one experienced lioness, and they really had no kind of coordinated attack on buffalo. This was a settled Pride of, I think, eight lionesses and, of course, the big male. And that made a big difference to their buffalo hunting skills. They're back onto that as I say now, and they're able to very effectively take down buffalo. We haven't seen them doing it for a while. We haven't seen many buffalo for the last little while, but I'm pretty sure that when the buffalo come back, so the Nkuhumas will start to show their hunting skills. Let's go back to Tolly and find out how he's doing with a bird whose call he's not yet mastered. Oh, look what we have here. I think this afternoon is also for birding. I've tried by all means to look for the Inkuhuma pride, but no luck. We are looking at the woodland kingfisher, which is a migratory bird that migrates from up north to the side during summertime. It's an intra-African migrant, which it only migrates grades within the borders of Africa. We have a lot of kingfishers here in Juma, up to seven to eight kingfishers we find here. This is a breeding pair, I think, but it's so hard to make its call. These are beautiful, but I'm still struggling to to mimic Woodland's Kingfisher's call, but I'll try to to mimic this call. Let me try it. Yeah, let me try again. No, I'm still struggling, but I will try to sharpen my call so that I will be happy. This is the hardest call to mimic. So let's go to Tristan and leave these beautiful birds while they are busy chatting about their breeding. Let's go to Tristan. Well, as you can see, while Oli is busy with calls, our Ellies were having the best mud bath. Unfortunately, though, they've all decided just to stand up. Of course, that's how it would go. They've been busy with their bath the whole time. And as soon as you guys come to us, then it's... What are you doing? You are a fool. Ellies make me laugh. Um, as soon as they you come to us, they then all decide to stand up and move off. But they were all in a little puddle on the ground at one point, all rolling around in the soft mud that's been created by the rain. And basically just above them is where the storm is and you'll see every now and then probably flashes of lightning so there's quite a bit of lightning that's around and hopefully it doesn't come back our way again because it's going to be a bit of a problem if it does we don't need much lightning to be around as well 
Now, I believe you did see the lightning just now, so it was a big bolt that kind of went across the sky. It seems, though, that it's pushing away from us, which is good news, because as much as I enjoy the rain, I'm quite tired of it this afternoon. It has just followed us everywhere, and I'm quite happy if we can get at least some semblance of dryness on our way home. What is going to be unfortunate on our way home, though, is that we're going to have to put lights on and after rain there's lots of insects and so it's going to be hazardous for our eyes on the way home unfortunately but still absolutely beautiful you can see the rain kind of falling little flashes of light um, and this this is the back end of the buffalo herd that's also moving about at the moment we've kind of driven through them I wanted to get through them just to see if there was anything lurking on the back edge so anything to do with the happy zebras or like I said lions we are very very close to where that happy zebra den is um, in fact we're pretty much there so I was hoping that there would be some of them around but it just doesn't seem like anybody is here and isn't that quite a cool scene it's quite dramatic isn't it the lone buffalo kind of ambling along and then the streaks of rain in the background right so now we haven't had much luck with hyenas but we'll send you back down to South Africa with Sydney who I believe wants to talk about the Juma clan So you can see that I have got a lovely uh, termite mound, which is not that very much big. But who knew that uh, this termite mound, at the end of the day, when is uh, the termite mound is fully grown, is going to accommodate animals such as the hyenas. Now I want to show you this lovely hyena sighting. A pretty's two growing cubs were content with their morning milk as their mother kept an eye on the den. A trouble came in a small package. Plonk was ready for play because Pretty was a designated babysitter. The three cubs began a game of exploration, noses to the ground, teeth ready to bite. The young stars are investigating more of the outside world, but still have the safety of the den while they can still squeeze into it. So you can see that uh, these uh, termites, uh, they are now becoming uh, beneficial to quite a lot of animals. Look at this uh, small termite mound here. I am not going to get surprised after many years when the hyenas are starting to stay in because it's going to grow and grow and grow more to become a big house. And the hyenas, as well, the, as, well as the other predators and all these other animals, when they are at the den, they get involved a lot on quite a lot of playing. Some of these animals are born with the instinct behavior, whereas some, they have to learn. So le playing is an integral part of learning. So these kind of animals, when they are playing, is when they are getting the strategies of survival. So now let's uh, cross over to one of my colleagues at the moment. It's uh, been very difficult to find the hyenas at the den of late, unfortunately. I'm not sure why they have avoided being around me when I go there, but I hope to spend a little bit of time with them in the near future. It won't be uh, the very near future because I'm going on holiday tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Now, one of the things that we haven't done for a long time is a little microphone microscope segment. Now, I know this isn't strictly character-based, but what I'm going to do is quickly show you a caterpillar. Now, I think that this caterpillar belongs to one of the acreas. There we go. Beautiful colours. Oops, he's climbed away. Let's come back to me before I find him again. More people will become sick. And he's got gorgeous navy blue colours. Sit still, little blighter. You see, it's so hot. There we go. Gorgeous navy blue colours and lovely lime green. Now, let's see if you can do that a little faster, shall we, Kirsten? Here we go. And wait a second and go. There we go. Beautiful. There is little suckers at the back. It's been a long time since I've done this and been out of practice. Look at the navy blue, shiny, sparkly kind of sequiny things that he's got on his back there. What a beautiful little caterpillar. And like I said, I think he belongs to the Acrea family. 
Paula, he is very vivid indeed. And we'll put him back outside so that he can survive there. Isn't that lovely? There he is. That's what he looks like when he's not crawling around under the microscope. Swoop, I've also missed the microscope so much, I must say. It's one of my favourite things to do out here. And if you look at him carefully, you can see he's got six legs on the front. People often mistake uh, caterpillars for in not being insects, but he is most, whoops, certainly an insect. He has six legs in the front, and underneath those, he's got suckers. Let me just pull him out for you and put him back on there. There you are. You see, he's got six legs, and then he's got all those suckers on the back, which are not legs, and they'll disappear when he's an adult. Very good, Marcel. Excellent job. He also appears to have a small, uh, what looks like a, a passenger. Anyway, there we go. Now next week apparently we are not having safari lives. I've just been told that. I have no idea why. I suspect it's because we simply don't have enough staff still on site uh, to edit all the clips together and coordinate everything. We are going down to the skeleton Christmas uh, stuff. So, that's going to be it. I must say thank you very much to all of you for a wonderful year. It's been here. I'm going off on my holidays and I will see you next year and it has been just uh, wonderful again. I'm constantly amazed every time I come back from leave that I still enjoy coming back from leave and I suppose that says all it needs to about the job that we do over here. So thank you very much, all of you, for the part you play in that. It's been marvellous. You'll be in the hands of Steve, Sydney and David for the next three weeks and, of course, a few of the trainees. Until I see you next year, bye-bye and stay safe. Well done. Oh.